51, as we'll refer to it often. It had really been a messy affair. But now, after a long, long time, long last, things seem to be going well. I mean, you know, who could fault a king for indulging in his fantasies? Uh, that's what kings do. You know, one night you're out for a stroll, you see a beautiful woman, you want her, you send for her, she comes to you. As simple as that. Kings have been doing things like that since the beginning of time. Whatever the king wants, king gets. That's why they call him the king. And in that day, in that time, really it shouldn't seem like a very big deal to most of the people. It's, in fact, it still happens today. You know, who among us is really surprised when you find out that a president or a prime minister or a monarch of some country has got a girlfriend or two on the side? Not saying it's right, but does it shock us anymore? You know, it, it doesn't happen all the time, but it still happens. You know, people hear about it, they shrug their shoulders, they snicker a little bit, or, you know, they make jokes about it, or they, they simply just don't like it, but they don't say anything because nothing they can do about it. Like I said, not trying to justify things, just trying to say that's just the way things are. Well, the king in this instance felt like things were finally settling down. Oh, yeah, there had been a problem with the woman's husband, but he took care of that. You know, it was, it was not an easy thing to get rid of him. He tried to trick him into uh, coming back from the battlefield and have him, having uh, him meet up with his wife. And so that when she got pregnant, everybody would just assume it was his baby. But when that didn't work, because he wasn't easily fooled and he was more of a, had more honor than the king did, he sent him right back to the front of the battle lines and essentially had him murdered, you know? So he ended up, the husband ended up looking like a hero in his death. And when that, of course, when he died, the king felt free to, to take his wife as, as his own wife, and that's exactly what he did. Then came the happy news that the woman was pregnant and everything was just right with the world. But, and there's always a but. But there were other people to be here from. Second uh, Samuel said, the thing that David did displeased the Lord. And the king was about to learn the hard way that God will not be mocked. And he was about to learn or be reminded that your sins will find you out. And that's when Nathan, the prophet, the man of God, entered into the picture. He told the king a little story about how a rich man who had many sheep stole from a poor man who only had the one ewe sheep in his whole flock. And that was the only, that was the only animal, the only piece of livestock that the, uh, his family owned. And the question was asked, what, what should be done to the rich man who acted so ruthlessly? And, and the king answered without any, without any hesitation and in his righteous anger, saying, that man should be put to death. And then the man delivered the message. The prophet said, King, you are the man. And in that moment, in one heart-stopping moment, the king knew the truth. He knew that Nathan was saying what had happened. He knew that Nathan knew from God what had taken place. He knew that he was a poor rich man who had stolen from the, old, from the, from the poor man. The king was guilty. And very quickly he remembered hearing the word of God. God said, I gave you everything you had. I made you king. If that wasn't enough, I would have made you, I'd have given you more. He said, you took this man's wife. Why did you despise my word? Uh, you had him murdered. There'll be nothing but trouble for you from this day forward. Your family will suffer because of your sin. All of those things he knew to be true, but the worst part of the news was the, second, the piece of news that came next. Your son will die. And the king wept. 
And the king prayed. And the king fasted. And the son died. Then came the, the time for the king to do the hardest thing he ever did in his life. After his son died, he went and he looked in the mirror and he said, I have sinned. You know, those have got to be the three hardest words in the English language. I have sinned. No one wants to say them. But yet every one of us is guilty. We would rather do anything or say anything other than that. But there's no way in the world we can ever get right with God and with each other until we admit that we have done wrong. Through his tears and in deep guilt, punishing himself for his own sinful folly, realizing at last how terribly wrong he had been, King David sat down and wrote the words that we now know as Psalm 51. 3,000 years later, we come back to it again and again and again and again because it tells us what it means to come back to God when we, are sin when we have sinned. Let's read it together. In Psalm 51, verse 1, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear the joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities." Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors, transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, that my mouth shall declare your praise. For you do not delight and sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. By your favor, do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, in burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then young bulls will be offered on your altar. 3,000 years later, those words still ring true. You know, these words have been, for generations, have been a lifeline back to God. Uh, it, was, it first began with the Jews who learned this poem and sung it back to God as a hymn. Uh, the Christians adopted it as their own. The words are so universal, anybody whose heart is broken because of sin know that the words belong to them. Folks, here's a simple application. If your heart is broken because of sin, these words are for you. If you have blown it, this psalm is for you. If you've looked at the wreckage of your own life, knowing you're full well that you're guilty of many foolish choices, if you despair of ever finding forgiveness, if you think you are not worthy because you have blown it before God, these words are for you. In reality, there are three parts to this, this, to this prayer. First, David confesses his sin. Then he prays for cleansing. And then he offers a prayer of consecration. Look at that. Confession, cleansing, and consecration. Warren Wiersbe says that David prayed three things. Well, I won't advance. 
He prayed, forgive me, cleanse me, and use me. So if, you, if your sin feels like a weight on your shoulders that's bearing you down and you just can't get out from under it, today's message in this psalm is just for you. The words are so universal. As I said a while ago, they belong to anyone whose heart is broken because of sin. Let's look in more detail at these three prayers that David offered. First of all, we see confession. David begins with God in verses 1 and 2. He cries out for God's mercy, His love, and compassion to blot out His transgressions and wash away His iniquity. The time for making excuses is over and done. There can be no rationalization for the adultery and murder that he committed. There's no way of saying, well, kings do it all the time. Everybody else is doing it. Or I just fell in a moment of weakness. As long as a person is making a conf excuses for their sin, they will not ever be forgiven. If you feel like you need to justify your sin, you're not ready to be forgiven. Truth of the matter is, God doesn't make deals. If sin is to be forgiven, it must be confessed. God does not forgive weakness. He forgives sin. He doesn't say, boys will be boys. I understand how weak you are, so I'll let it go this time. God doesn't make deals. If sin is to be forgiven, it must be confessed for what it is. You can't call sin a weakness. And then ask for forgiveness. You can't call sin a mistake and then expect to be forgiven. You've got to call it exactly what it is. It is sin. You can, be, you can think of all these different words. You can think of all these different excuses. But we got to call it exactly what it is. Sin is the problem. We are guilty not of mistakes. We're not guilty of weaknesses. We're not guilty of, of shortcomings. We are guilty of sin. And that's what the problem is in the world today. We can call it all different things. People try and say it's gun control that was, that's needed. It's, it's uh, inflation control that's needed. It's population control that's needed. No, what's needed is, is to confess of our sin and ask for forgiveness. Because that's the only thing that's ever going to fix us. That's why the king uses all these different words to express the depth of his sin. Look at it. He called it transgressions, iniquity, sin. And finally, in verse 4, he called it evil. Looking into the cesspool of his own heart, he sees nothing good, nothing to mitigate his enormous crimes. And look at verse 4. He says an extraordinary thing. He's, David confesses to God in verse 4, Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Had he not sinned against Uriah? Not once, but twice. Had he not sinned against Bathsheba for stealing her husband? Had he not sinned against the people of Israel? Every one of those are true. He sinned against all those people. But finally, he had to deal with God. All sin is treason against Almighty God. And until we grasp that, until we see it, until we confess it, we cannot be forgiven. So David says to God, you're right to judge me. I'm not going to question your ways. And then he says, you know, I've been a sinner all my life. I was even conceived in sin. You know, he said, I know that you desire the truth from the inside out. You know, every time I read that, it kind of reminds me of the Jack Nicholson character in the movie A Few Good Men. When he's on trial and Tom Cruise as a lawyer stands up and he says, well, Nicholson says to Cruise, the lawyer, do you want the truth? And when when Cruz answers, yes, I do. You know the line that Nicholson uses. You can't handle the truth. You know? The truth is sometimes is hard to handle, is it not? And sometimes, especially when the truth is about ourselves, you, it's hard to handle. You know, some years, it's more years than I want to admit now, but when I was a student in seminary, I had a gifted professor who gave us as one of the in-class assignments a personality t inventory. We filled out the inventory, answering the different questions, marking them appropriately, and then we handed it back in, and a few days later he gave us the results. Now, at least he didn't have the... Uh, 
Well, let me put it this way. He did have the wisdom to not give us the results orally. He, he printed out the results, he put them in an envelope, and he gave them to us. There were a lot of papers in that envelope. It was a thick envelope. But I know what startled me more than anything else is a takeoff of John 8.32 that he wrote on the outside of the envelope. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. But it's going to hurt for a little while. And that's so true. Sometimes the, hurt, the truth does hurt us. You know? Look, most people have, you know why most people have trouble growing spiritually? We know the truth. You know, we've got so much truth running out of it, it's just running out of our eyeballs. We read it, we learn the truth in the Bible. We learn the truth in sitting and listening to sermons. We learn the truth in Sunday school lessons. We even today, we got different recordings on tape and CD and DVD about truth. We, we listen to it on the internet, different blogs that we follow. All, there's truth everywhere. If, it, look, if just knowing the truth was all we needed, every one of us would be saints, isn't it? But the truth is, the problem runs deeper than that. We know the truth, but we don't want to be hurt, so we deflect it. We ignore it. We deny it. We argue with it. And in general, we avoid it in any way we can. We put up such a good shield so that we can de de to deflect all the arrows of truth that are coming at us. And after a while, we get so good at deflecting the truth that the truth never gets through us at all. We hear the truth. We know the truth. But we deflect the truth. Therefore, we are not free. We're still angry, stubborn, bitter, greedy, arrogant, lustful, self-willed, critical, unkind. The truth never really changes us because we won't let it get close enough to hurt us. Honesty is the first step to admitting your true condition. And the first step to forgiveness is being honest with God. That's exactly what David did. When David cried out for God's mercy, he acknowledged the true source of the problem and where the healing must, must begin. Until there is truth. Instead of making excuses, instead of covering up, instead of pretending everything is okay, when we can truthfully come and stand before God and say against you, God, and against you only I have sinned, until we can do that, we will never get better. And God cannot teach us wisdom. Would you like to be set free? Would you like to be set free, church? It'll happen only after you let the truth hurt you first and then heal you. David's saying, I know what you want, Lord. You want me to stop playing games. You want me to stop making excuses. You want me to be honest with you, and I'm ready to do that. No more excuses. No more games. I'm guilty in your eyes, and I admit it. It all begins with confession. And after we confess, then we ask for cleansing. Not only does David not hide his sin, and not only does he not minimize his sin, he begs God for a deep work of grace to cleanse him from the stain of sin. He wants God to wash him from the inside out. Because he wrote this psalm himself, he clearly does not care. He does not care who knows what he did, or how desperately he seeks the need, uh, seeks the grace of God. True confession is a humbling but necessary condition and experience. When the things that matters is getting free from the burden of sin, when we no longer sugarcoat our sin, when we desperately seek restored fellowship with God and with others that we have wronged, when we no longer worry about our reputation, when we want what God wants, and when what God thinks matters more than what other things, other people think, then we will find the forgiveness we seek because our repentance has led us back to God. It all starts with God. 
If you look at the request that David made in verses 7 through 12, you can see clearly a sevenfold path of restoration. It's not enough to be forgiven. We need to know that God has put our sins far away from us. But it's perfectly possible to be saved and still be miserable because we have not accurately, rightly dealt with our sin. So look at this sevenfold process of cleansing that he explains to us. First of all, we need to be cleansed by the blood. He says in verse 7, cleanse me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Hyssop was one of the plants that was used in the first Passover in Egypt. The Jews would dip the hyssop in blood, the blood of the lamb, smear the blood on the doorpost. And then when the death angel came over and they saw the blood, he saw the blood spread on the doorpost, he would pass over that house and take the firstborn of those houses that didn't that were not marked. That is the same hyssop that he tells us to cleanse, that he asked God to cleanse him with. The lamb, the Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, is the one who cleanses us and washes away our sin. You ever thought, stop to think, why did Jesus have to die for our sins? Why did he have to die to forgive us our sins? The answer is really quite simple. That's because sin is so deeply embedded in us, it can't be cured by anything other than death. The old life has to die. God will not improve upon it. Even God won't make it better. He cannot cleanse it or wash it. He can only put sin to death. And that's why David understands that now. He says to God, if you're going to deal with me, if you're going to deal with this terrible fountain of evil in me, I can see that it must be put to death. Purge me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Not only do we need to be cleansed by the blood, but secondly, we need a new hope. He says in verse 8, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Lord, I've been laying down so long. I've been sinning so long that all I can see is darkness. Shine your light in my heart so that, so that my, I can sing with joy once more. Thirdly, we need to know that our sins are forgiven. He said, hide in verse 9, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. You know, it's not just enough to be forgiven. We need to know that God has put our sins as far away from us as possible. He says in the, in, throughout His Word that He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. That He has taken our sins and He has cast them behind His back. He says that He has buried our sins in the deepest part of the sea, of the ocean. And He says, I remember them no more. That's why when the devil tries to bring up our past, when the devil keeps trying to, to make us dwell on how far we have fallen, we can simply say, those sins are forgiven. Those sins are forgotten. Those sins are gone forever and ever and ever. As part of our cleansing process, we also need a clean heart. In verse 10, he says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. When he's praying this, what David is saying, he says, I know I can't fix myself. I can't cre recreate myself. Only you can do that. Lord, restore my heart. King knows that unless God makes him pure, he will never get there on his own. But he's also praying for a steadfast spirit so that he can avoid the temptations in the future. Because he knew that even though the sins would be forgiven, the temptation would continue. Fifthly, David teaches us that we need a, the restoration of the Holy Spirit's power. In verse 11 he says, Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit away from me. You know, only a true believer can pray, pray, pray like this. Spurgeon said that an unbeliever wouldn't care about it, the least little bit about casting, being cast away from God's presence because he was never in God's presence to start with. The ungodly flee from God's presence and hide from the Holy Spirit. Only the child of God feels the pain of the Lord's discipline. Those who do have dwelt in the sunlight of His love shiver in the darkness His displeasure. Sixth, 
part of cleansing. We need to regain the joy of God's salvation. Rejoice, if it says in the first half of 12a, uh, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Now notice, David never lost his salvation. Yes, he sinned, and he sinned horribly. But he never lost his salvation. You aren't going to lose yours either because of sin. But you will lose your joy of that salvation. You will lose the reward of that salvation. Every sin, whether big or small, separates us from God. It separates us from the fellowship with God. It is perfectly possible to be saved and at the same time be miserable because we have not dealt rightly with sin. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And not only do we need to regain that joy, we need to have a new inner desire. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. David means make me glad to obey you. You know, you know I never want to do anything more than obey God. I've told you before how mamas and daddies are different. Now, Mama would give me a long list of things to do and not to do every time I left the house when I was still living there, whether I was going out on a date or whether I was going out back to school or whatever. Long list. She, and it was the same list every time. You know, do this, do this, do this, do this. Don't do that. Don't do that. Now, you mothers know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, you know. In fact, I asked my mama one time, I said, Mama, you always, and she always told me as I was walking out the door. I mean, I'm in a hurry at that point. In fact, I told her at one point, I said, Mama, you tell me the same thing over and over and over again. I've heard it for years. Why don't you just record it and put it on tape and I'll just listen to it. Up until the dementia stole her, her mind. Every day, I'm out, every time I talked to my mother, the last thing she said to me before we hung up was play the tape. You know, I, now my daddy was different. Papa just simply said two things. He said, remember who you are and whose you are. Yeah, they were both telling me the same thing. But my father was, said, was just putting in one concise term. Remember who you are and whose you are. That's it. I want, look, I don't remember all the specifics that Mama said, but I remember everything Papa said. Remember who you are and whose you are. And I did everything I could to make sure I never disappointed him. I know I did, but I tried not to. That's exactly what God's telling us here in Psalm 51. Remember who you are and whose you are. That's why David prayed, grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Until we have personally experienced God's pardoning grace, the whole message of the gospel is nothing but theoretical. Sevenfold path it's the right road for every sinner who wants to find peace with God. We start with the blood of Jesus, and we will end with a new hope, new joy, and a new desire to serve the Lord. So when we have sinned, it begins first with confession. Secondly, it, begins, it continues with cleansing. And thirdly, it ends with consecration. Consecration gives us three things. First of all, it gives us a new mission. Look at verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. As David considered all the lessons that he had learned following his tragic affair with Bathsheba, he vowed to God that he would use this experience to call sinners to return to God. Until we have personally experienced God's grace, we can never lead anybody else back to the right relationship with God. Because we are out of fellowship with God. But you let a person declare how God rescued him in a moment of helpless set desperation. You let him speak of how openly he despaired of ever finding peace with God. And then he found peace with Jesus Christ, who lifted him up, who forgave his sins, who gave him a new life, who set his feet in a new direction. And that man will never quit, sh quit shouting and praising and telling others about God. The, it's, it's like Gomer Pyle, the time that Andy put out a little fire while Gomer, while Gomer was sleeping in the, in the service station. He told everybody, let me tell you about the man who saved my life. 
Well, God did much more than save my life. He saved my soul from the very pits of hell. And if that ain't something to shout about, you got a problem. And when we get, we know, what, realize what all God has done for us, how He has forgiven us, how He has restored us, how He has given us new life, new meaning, new purpose, we got something to shout about. We got something to shout about. Amen. Let's shout. There needs to be more shouting in the church and less doubting. So we get a new mission. Secondly, there is a new worship. He says in verse 15, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. I wonder, just a few minutes ago, I was watching around the, the congregation. We were singing the songs. Some of you were singing. Some of you weren't. But I wonder if those of you who were singing, how many of you were singing a song and how many of you were worshiping him? Praising God. That's what it's all about. Look, the reason we sing is not just to have entertainment, not just to have something to do to make the hour last longer, not have any, it's not even time for, to, to prepare us for how good a message or how good a song it might be. It's all about worshiping God and giving Him our absolute best. Worship is what it's all about. God, David never forgot his sin, nor did David ever forget the grace that found him in the midst of his sin. His lips were shut until grace, like a river pouring out from heaven, came down upon him. Then he would not be silent. Then he could not be silent. Truly forgiven people love to tell others what God has done for them. That's what testimony is all about. So not only do we, does consecration give us a new, new mission, a new worship, it also gives us a new understanding. Because look at the verses in 16 and 17. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it to it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart you will not despise. God doesn't want more religion. In the old days, it was the, the blood of bulls and goats. In modern times, it's church attendance and money in the offering plate. You know, you could go to church for a thousand Sundays in a row. Never miss one of them. And it's not going to remove the stain of even one sin. David knew that no bull, no goat, no turtle dove, no burnt offering, no altar could ever atone for the sins of murder and adultery. What God wants is a broken and contrite heart. That he will never turn away. So David prayed after being confronted with his sin, a prayer of confession, a prayer of cleansing, a prayer of consecration. And that leads me back to the question I began with. How much sin will God forgive? Or put it another way. How far can we go? How deep into sin can we sink before God will no longer forgive us? The answer is to that question, nobody knows. Because nobody's ever gone that far yet. Truth of the matter is, no matter how wicked you've been in the past, if you turn to the Lord, He will abundantly pardon you. If God forgave David, He will forgive you. If a murdering adulterer can find grace, there is hope for you and me. So how much sin will God forgive? All of it. Every single piece. No sin is beyond God's grace if we turn to Him with a broken and contrite heart. Forgiveness is always possible, but only for those who deal deeply and honestly with their own sin. So knowing that God will forgive all of our sin is a more important question we need to answer. Do you even want to be forgiven? Do you want to be forgiven? The reason why I ask that question is because sin can so harden the heart that you don't even want to be forgiven anymore. You, don't, you no longer care 
unfortunately, I deal, deal with some of these people at the prison. Their hearts are so hard. They don't want forgiveness. They don't think they can be forgiven. They say they don't deserve forgiveness. None of us do. But God will freely give forgiveness to all who will come and all who will ask. If you have the slightest desire to be forgiven, if you have the slightest desire in your heart for a new beginning, your sins can be forgiven. Because the truth of the matter is, it's not about you. It's not about your sin. It's all about God. And it's all about His grace. In verse 7, David prayed, Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Would you like that? Would you like to be washed? Would you like to have the stain of sin removed from your life? Would you like to be whiter than snow? It can only happen if you come to the Lord with the same attitude that David came to, to God with. In the early 1870s, a man by the name of James Nicholson worked at a clerk in the Philadelphia Post Office. He was, he was very active in the Warden Street Methodist Episcopal Church. He wrote a song that became very popular on that, in that time, and it's still popular today, based on Psalm 51, verse 7. That's, that song became the theme song during D.L. Moody's revival campaigns. I want you to take, reach up and grab the hymn book in front of you. From the, seat, from the seat in front of you, reach up and grab a handbook, a hymn book, and turn to hymn number 325. And you're going to see this poem, this song that Jack Nicholson wrote. Hymn 325. Read with me. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want thee forever to live in my soul. Break down every idol, cast out every foe. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, for this I most humbly entreat. I wait, blessed Lord, at thy crucified feet. By faith, for thy cleansing, I see your blood flow. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, before you I patiently wait. Come now, and within me a new heart create. To those who have sought you, you never said no. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow? Yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Of all those words, I think the most important, you see in verse 3, to those who have sought you, you never said no. God never turns away an honest seeker. No matter what you've done, where you've been, how ugly your sin be, may be, how long you've been wallowing in the pit of sin, none of that matters. If you will come to Jesus, He will never say no. Those who come to Him with a broken heart will always be washed whiter than snow. Father God, right now, just as David did so many years ago, we confess that against you and you alone we have sinned. But create within us a clean heart. Wash us, purify us, restore us. And as only you can, Restore the joy of our salvation. Father, right now, there are hundreds of people who are hearing this message who do not think that their sins can be forgiven. But you have told us over and over and over again, and especially in this, the words of these, this Psalm 51, that you're willing You've never told anyone no who came to you 
seeking after you and your, your forgiveness. Lord, it's all about you. It's all about your grace. It's all about your mercy. It's all about your love. Wash us, cleanse us, and make us whiter than snow. This is our prayer in your name. Amen. Amen. I don't know what you're dealing with today. But whatever it is, we simply just give it to God. Maybe you've got unconfessed sin in your life. Now is the time to confess it. The altar is open if you want to do just that. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because you think that your sins disqualify you in some way. But no, that's not at all what the reality is. So if today you're dealing with those sins and the conviction of the Holy Spirit is upon you, cry out to Him in true, honest confession and accept the salvation that He gives to you as part of His grace, His mercy. As this invitation is extended to each and every one of you, you come as we stand together.